so I, I want to talk a little, give you a little bit of time to actually talk about your PhD a little bit. Um, do you spend any time on Reddit at all? No, not really. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, so all I'm familiar with Reddit, but I don't use it. Okay, that's 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 okay. So there's there's a there's a subreddit which is Reddit is just a forum with sub forums basically. So when I say subreddit, it's a sub forum. So there's a sub forum called Explain Like I'm Five, and it's basically people asking very complicated, often science questions, um, and they want it really dumbed down for them. So can you give the Explain Like I'm Five version of what combustion dynamics is and what the heck you're doing? Okay. Um... So if you've ever sat around a campfire, um, you'll hear this kind of roaring noise, right? Like this kind of, what we'd call it is broadband noise. Basically, uh, there's not like a, a tone to it. If you sing, you kind of think, okay, you know, there's typically one frequency and we call that frequency a tone. Um, but when you have fire, it tends to, the wrinkles in the flame tend, I mean, um, uh, when gas passes through a flame, it expands, and that expansion makes sound waves, acoustic okay. waves. Um, and we hear those um, as different frequencies depending on how the flame is wrinkled. Um, so generally speaking, a flame excites a, a wide range of frequencies, and so it doesn't have like a particular tone. Um, but if you think of something like um, a gas turbine um, on a plane or in a power plant, um, the kind of like confined geometry of those combustors acts kind of like a trumpet where it kind of picks a tone. So you're basically um, putting in this broadband noise and it's filtering that out and giving you a tone. And okay. so what happens um, once you pick a tone like that, that tone tends to resonate in that environment. Um, and then it'll wrinkle the flame that that tone itself will then wrinkle the flame to produce more disturbances at that tone. Okay. And so this kind of, this process kind of continues and it's like a self-excited feedback loop mm -hmm. where wrinkles in the flame excite this tone, this tone then feeds back into whatever's producing the wrinkles in the flame um, to generate more tones. Um, and this is a huge problem in the like gas turbine industry. I mean, um, I think 70% uh, of the costs that like a power plant faces um, has to do, or a gas turbine plant, has to do with repairing the hardware that's damaged by instabilities like that. So that includes employee salaries, uh, that includes um, any other law or legal expenses or anything like that. So mm -hmm. out of their, the, I, I, it does exclude their fuel, fuel costs. Um, but like the majority of their expenses has to do with repairing damaged things um, that occur from these kind of instabilities. Because, um, you know, you think of a trumpet, and it's not that loud. Um, but what, what those tones are are pressure oscillations. And those pressure oscillations actually get so strong that they can uh, cause the flame to move in such a way that it damages the combustor itself. Um, okay, so so is it the... So, so is it the... The oscillations that are causing the damage or the effect on the the fuel that's the, it, and, the, it, and then the changing of the fuel that's causing the damage yeah it's 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 complicated and it can be it's usually the the fact that like it pushes the flame into somewhere where a flame is not supposed to be okay um but it can all basically if you have enough pressure change you can cause flow to flow backwards or flow to go way faster than it normally would um, and so you're just kind of pushing this flame all over. Like if you think of, you know, a candle, if you thought about, you know, waving that candle around the room without it blowing out, um, mm. it would find something that it wasn't supposed to be next to, and it would, <laughs> it would either catch it on fire or damage it somehow. Right. Um, so you can kind of think of it like that, where, you know, you're, if you're an engineer and you're designing a combustor, you're going to design a flame to go here, and you're going to design something else to go here, mm. and, you know, every place, everything has its place. And these instabilities are kind of mixing that all around. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm going, I think, I'm, I might not be explaining this as concisely as it would be nice if I could. No, I mean, there's, well, especially in the, like, explain like I'm five subreddit, there's, a, there's only, like, so far you can dumb down. You have to use things like combustor and, like, you know, like there are certain yeah, yeah. words that you need to use. Otherwise, it doesn't even make sense anymore. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, but uh, basically what I study is, you know, this combustion dynamics is a large part of it, but I really study the, the fluid mechanical part, which has, which basically means um, I talked about how like the, the flame generates these tones and then the environment uh, amplifies certain tones. And then the way I'm really interested in how do those tones then couple back with the flow to wrinkle the flame in such a way that those tones are generated in the first place. So, okay, so you're so you're interested in in essentially the second and subsequential parts of the feedback loop. Yeah, okay. yeah. The, it's called the hydrodynamic part of the feedback loop. So how okay. to you basically induce all these are called vortices. They're little kind of wrinkles in the flow, basically. Um, and how do those wrinkles in the flow wrinkle the flame, and then excite those instabilities? Okay, um, so. How do you actually study that? Like, what, like, what kind of instruments? I mean, how do you go about measuring something like that? Uh, so we actually at Georgia Tech, the combustion lab here is a it's a really great facility. And I am not an experimentalist, but I look at a lot of experimental data. Okay. Um, and basically, the way you do it is you take pictures with really fancy cameras. Um, okay. Uh, so basically, um, if you think about if you went out on a snowy day and you took pictures really fast, uh, like in, uh, like with a camera, basically, you'd see snowflakes moving, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you looked at two frames between those uh, pictures of snowflakes, you could kind of say, okay, you know, I can see from this first frame, one snowflake moved from here to here, and this snowflake moved from here to here, just by looking at the difference between the two frames, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, if you do that on with, you know, super precise cameras and scientific instruments, you can basically do the same thing in this combustor environment where you seed it with these tiny little particles and then take really good pictures really fast, I'm talking nanosecond type right. speeds. Um, and uh, from that, you're able to like infer a velocity field. Um, and so you can study how, you know, if, if I'm, if I basically, you just put a speaker next to it and you, turn on the speaker at different tones and you look at how the flow behaves with different forcing, you know, like styles, different amplitudes, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you're able to ex uh, explicitly kind of gauge this flow response. Okay. Um, so this is just a curiosity. It's really a side note. It doesn't tell too deep in no. anything, but um, I'm curious, like, are, is, are the pictures being taken in visible spectrum or are you working like an infrared because you're working with like combustibles or like how do you know like like what are you working with as far as like actually taking those snapshots yeah so these are visible spectrum okay. uh, snapshots um you can change so typically these are done with green lasers basically uh if you just take really fast high speed pictures there's not enough exposure for your for a camera to like see the particles mm -hmm. and so to to generate the kind of expo or exposure we need, we shine a really bright laser on the particles. Um, and so those par those lasers are typically green um, for the experiments that we've been doing. Okay. Uh, I say we, but again, I'm not the one doing these experiments. Yeah, I'm yeah, looking yeah. at the data. Um, you're, you're the figurehead right now, so I mean, it's, it's okay. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, you shine a really bright green laser at them, um, and then you look at how those tiny particles kind of dance around in response to the different tones you play them. Okay, so are the particles, so you, you know, obviously I'm coming at this from like a, I know absolutely nothing, so right, right. just treat, treat me as a, a plebeian. Um, are the particles actually like pre-combustion particles or post-combustion or a mixture of the both or, you know, like? That's a good question. Uh, they're, they're non, they are solid particles that we kind of, so we kind of mix a uh, fuel and oxidizer ahead okay. of time, um, and those are both gaseous. Right. Um, and then in addition to that sort of gaseous thing, which is actually what burns, we inject all these tiny little micrometer sized particles or several micrometer sized particles. Mm -hmm. um, and those are what we actually see. Okay, so, so it's an, scatters off those particles. And okay, we take, it's, it's, so it's an indicator, not the, the, not the, the flow itself. itself. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Is some, you have to uh, do your analysis correctly to make sure that you're using the right size and weight particles right. to accurately kind of represent what the flow is doing. Right, because it, it's, it's, um, 
It reminds me of this Buddhist quote. It says, it's the finger pointing to the moon, not the moon itself. And like, basically, like you're not actually staring at the thing that you're studying. You're staring at the thing that's pointing to the thing. Yes. Yeah. So you can't get confused between the two because there is right, it's right. not exactly the same thing. Right. So like, so I mean, it's always it's always curious to me like how people get to where they are. So like, how do you how do you get from being a you know, a kindergartner to working on combustion dynamics, like, you know, obviously a truncated timeline, but I mean, how did you get interested in what you're doing? Um, so in undergrad, I had an awesome professor who pulled me aside after class one day, I think sophomore year, and basically said, what are you going to do after college? And I, you know, kind of said what I thought I was supposed to say, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm looking for an internship now and then I'll get a job. And you know, whatever, I'll be an engineer and that's that, you know, I, I didn't really have like a, this was not like a lifelong goal for me. Um, but I had that conversation with him and he invited me to join his research group um, and to kind of see what I thought about research. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, I was also, I, I, I worked at two years for Caterpillar in my undergrad. Okay. Um, kind of got the big company and industry experience in engineering and I didn't really like that. Um, so I kind of knew I didn't really want to go on that route, but I had a really great experience uh, working in this research environment. Um, it's really fun. You you ask questions and you kind of you ask hard questions and questions that hopefully no one else has ever asked and trying to figure out a way to answer them. Um, and basically, I've spent the last almost five years trying to ask questions and figure out how to answer them. So it's a really kind of cool and frustrating sometimes process, but it can be really rewarding. Um, and I had, I guess, enough rewarding experiences in that first exposure to it to kind of convince me that this is something I'd like to do more of. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, it's just a matter of writing applications. And I, I never really had my eye on combustion dynamics. Um, I liked math. I did a minor in math mm -hmm. in addition to mechanical engineering. And um, this is a very math heavy research area. Right. Um, so that, that kind of set me up for it. Um, and I knew I wanted to do something where I could kind of exploit my background in math to, to, do, to get a head start. Um, so this kind of seemed like a good way to do that. But really when I came here, I was looking at, I talked to professors who are doing modeling of uh, brains, um, you know, nonlinear networks and stuff like that. And I talked to, you know, all sorts of other different people from different backgrounds. Um, the really cool thing about science is it's a process um, mm -hmm. and you develop an expertise in a field, but what you're really working on is the process of like, how do I ask intelligent questions and design experiments that answer those questions and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's problem solving. It just, you know, right. if you enjoy solving problems, then I think it's something you can enjoy. You just got to learn how to enjoy it. Yeah, I see that. See that thought, like enjoying problem solving is, is how I ended up being a math major. <laughs> yeah. So like I, I decided after calculus in high school, I was like, no more math. And then I was like, oh, it's only 15 hours for a math minor. And then I was like, well, why don't I just, it's only one more class per semester for a math major. So I just continued for it. But I like, I enjoyed the problem solving. So I definitely can like empathize. I, I don't know that I was interested in the math just for math's sake, but I definitely loved the journey of like figuring out how to do proofs and like understanding the logic behind all this, you know, all these different I'll call them systems, but different fields. Yeah. Um, so like it's it's definitely like easy to to sympathize with you. And there's um, some kind of parallel with triathlon too, and that you're kind of your your goal is something that you very, you spend very little time achieving your goal in triathlon and in mm -hmm. science. Most of it is in the kind of nitty gritty daily grind. Um, and if you're able to find a way to enjoy that, you know, daily struggle, then you can find a way. I mean then you enjoy the whole process. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at um, once you finish your thesis, <laughs> as we we're talking about before we get started, you're, you finished everything up. You just have your thesis to write, correct? Yeah. yeah. So after you're done, you're looking at postdoctoral work to do more research in academic field, like at yeah. the institution. That, that is something that appeals to me. That is not something that I have a direct track onto at this point yeah uh, like i mean it very well could happen but i've not you know really narrowed 
um, it down to exactly that, mm -hmm. uh, exactly a specific position. Um, I don't know, I, I taught, so this semester, this past semester, I taught my first course, and that was something I really enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd always kind of wondered if I would, I thought I would, um, and I, I did. Um, and so I've, uh, you know, I think that an academic setting could be something I enjoy, maybe not right away, but, you know, either much later on or soon later on. Um, I think my, my biggest focus is going to be on getting something kind of close to home. Um, in Atlanta here because my girlfriend is going to be another two or so years um, in her PhD. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to stay local. And there are a couple of prospects in this area, but uh, nothing set in stone yet. Okay. Um, I'm going to go off the deep end and this is just, just as a curiosity. I think I, so I always look at like people's Instagram, social media and kind of stuff. I, I think I saw you had taken a trip to India a couple of years ago. Yeah, I did. So I'm just curious, like, you know, I think our generation is, everybody's interested in travel, but it seems like almost hyper-focused in our generation. Like, we don't care about buying stuff. We just want to go places. So I'm curious, like, why did you go to India? Like, how, how did you end up on India, uh, you know, of all the places you could go instead of, you know, going and partying somewhere? Like, how did, you, how not, did you end up there? It was not a, uh, a, a vacation. It was a really cool trip. I okay. Really, I, I, like, enjoyed a lot. Um, but it was it was for um, my research. We have a collaborator um, at the Indian Institute of Science in Mangalore. Okay. Um, and so I spent roughly three weeks, I think, um, in his lab there, uh, working with one of his senior grad students who kind of mentored me and taught me so much. It was a great experience where, you know, it was, you know, more than 12 hours in the lab every day, just trying to soak up everything I could. Um, but in addition to that, I got to get out and take some pictures for Instagram. So that was fun. <laughs> uh, went to a, a Hindu temple, which was interesting, and uh, got to go around and try different foods. And um, one of the cool things about being a triathlon when you travel or being in triathlon when you travel is you get to go run around or try to I, I ended up not swimming or biking at all, but mm -hmm. just to run around the city and kind of explore. Um, and that was really cool. It's so different than here. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's so much commonality. I think travel is a really good way to see that. And it sounds super cliche, but you go around the world expecting to see a lot of different stuff. And, you know, you get there at first, you think, wow, this is so different. And then you stay there a week longer and you think, wow, we're really the same. So that was mm -hmm. my experience in a nutshell. I was like, if I'm anywhere new, whether I'm walking or running, I always feel like that's the best way to like explore a city. Like if you're in a car, things go by so quickly, you don't really get to absorb everything. So like, I definitely like to be on foot, whether I'm, you know, depending on how fast I'm moving, but I rather, I like to be on foot to kind yeah. of like see, actually I, see things. When I was in a car in India, in Bangalore, mm -hmm. I was more scared to look out the window than <laughs> I think. I, I didn't have time to think about sightseeing or looking around. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> So I got one last question for you, and I asked this of everybody because it's always different, and I love to hear what it is. Um, so if you only get to eat one thing for recovery for the rest of your life, what do you choose? It's Taco Tuesday. I got to go tacos. <laughs> See, and like Todd, Todd chose peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I was like, he didn't go cinnamon roll. I would have sworn he did he not. He did yeah, not go well, cinnamon. I gave him a hard time about that, but um, so, so you're really eating tacos after, like you go you go do a hard set, and then you're really eating tacos afterwards. I, I love tacos. Yeah, I'm gonna go home and have tacos after this. <laughs> Great. I'm, I'm, hey, I'm I'm glad you're consistent, Chris. <laughs> I I appreciate your time today. I'll uh, I'll let you go, and you can go get some tacos. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming on.